Well, hey there, I'm Joshua Johnson. It's great to be with you on this Tuesday, June 7th. And tonight, we're talking about protecting America from violence and extremism. My mother's life mattered. My mother's life mattered. And your actions here today will tell us how much it matters to you. That was just one emotional plea from today's Senate hearing on domestic terrorism. Homeland Security says our recent mass shootings might inspire more violence. But will they inspire change? Matthew McConaughey is pushing for new laws after describing the heartbreak in his hometown of Uvalde, Texas. They needed much more than makeup to be presentable. They needed extensive restoration. Why? Due to the exceptionally large exit wounds of an AR-15 rifle. Also tonight, should social networks be held accountable for our children's mental health? You'll meet a California family suing Instagram for allegedly driving their daughter to thoughts of suicide. And it's primary election day in seven states. We'll have more on the races in Iowa, and we'll check in on California with Steve Kornacki at the big board. So what do people from Uvalde, Texas, want to see done about gun violence? Today, one of its native sons spoke at the White House. Oscar winner Matthew McConaughey gave a kind of eulogy for the victims at Robb Elementary School. One child dreamed of being a marine biologist. Another was practicing a Bible verse to read at church, Deuteronomy 6.5. One teacher wanted to get a food truck after she retired. McConaughey said that America must take action so that their lives will matter. We need responsible gun ownership. Responsible gun ownership. We need background checks. We need to raise the minimum age to purchase an AR-15 rifle to 21. We need a waiting period for those rifles. We need red flag laws and consequences for those who abuse them. These are reasonable, practical, tactical regulations to our nation, states, communities, schools, and homes. Responsible gun owners are fed up with the Second Amendment being abused and hijacked by some deranged individuals. These regulations are not a step back. They're a step forward for a civil society and, and the Second Amendment. Look, is this cure-all? Hell no. But people are hurting. Families are, parents are. And look, as, as, as divided as our country is, this gun responsibility issue is one that we agree on more than we don't. It really is. We agree on it more than we don't. And it seems many Americans would agree with that sentiment. Check out the latest USA Today Ipsos poll. 69% of Americans said they support stricter gun laws. 21% say today's laws are enough. 10% think they should be relaxed. If you break it down along party lines, 88% of Democrats say they support stricter laws. Republicans are split 50-50, but that is an increase on the GOP side in support of 15 points from just last year. Let's begin tonight with Dr. Joseph Sacrin. He's a trauma surgeon and the director of emergency general surgery at Johns Hopkins Hospital in Baltimore. Dr. Sacrin, welcome to the program. Good to have you with us. Yeah, thanks for having me, Joshua. I wonder what your sense is right now of where we stand with the conversations in Congress about various measures. We know that there are things like an assault weapons ban and universal background checks that are off the table, at least for right now. Red flag laws, school security funding, mental health measures, those appear to be on the table among the bipartisan group of senators that's doing the negotiating. What's your sense of where we stand right now with these ideas on and off the table? Yeah, well, look, Joshua, first, let me just say that I come to this conversation both as a survivor and someone that's a trauma surgeon 
that is witnessing the daily toll of gun violence in America. And as we heard Matthew McConaughey in the clip that you showed point out that as Americans, we have a lot more in common than we have that divides us when it comes to this issue. What we don't have is the moral courage and the political will to act. And it's completely unacceptable. When I look at what they're discussing right now, here's the reality, is that like any complex public health problem, there is no one solution. It requires us to take a multifaceted approach across many different sectors. And so, you know, people always want to know, well, what's the one thing that we can do? It's not about one thing. We have to tailor those solutions to the specific aspects of the gun-related injuries we are trying to prevent. One of the things that Matthew McConaughey talked about, and I don't want to get terribly graphic about this because it is gruesome, but he did talk about how one young victim was identified after the shooting in Uvalde by the shoes that she was wearing. We've confirmed that the shoes that were in the hearing today were replicas of this child's shoes, but this was one of the more haunting moments from what he said in the press briefing today. Watch. Maite wore green high-top converse with a heart she had hand-drawn on the right toe because they represented her love of nature. Camilla's got these shoes. Can you show these shoes, please? Wore these every day. Green converse with a heart on the right toe. These are the same green converse on her feet that turned out to be the only clear evidence that could identify her after the shooting. How about that? Mm -hmm. I really don't want to get too deep into the gory details of this, but I think one of the points he was trying to make is that weapons of an AR-15 style, the assault style weapons, do unique kinds of damage to the human body that make the aftermath all the more unbearable. Is that right? Th that is correct, Joshua. And let me just back up and first say, I understand why people don't want to get into the gruesome details. But you know what, Joshua? Maybe that's exactly what the American public needs to see. We continue to wake up day after day and these senseless tragedies continue to happen. And what Matthew described is absolutely heart-wrenching, but that's one of many stories. Tomorrow at the House Oversight Committee, you're gonna hear an 11-year-old girl describe how she smeared blood all over herself so that if the gunman returned, he would think she was dead. Joshua, this is happening in America and the public has been shielded from these travesties. We have to do better. This is unacceptable. And I think it's time to peel back that curtain. I've, I've got my own views on that. Uh, personally, I, I am of mixed opinions as to how graphic to get with, with the details of what happens to children's bodies, partly because I don't want children growing up knowing what their insides look like. But that's a conversation for another day. Of the measures that are on the table, before I gotta let you go, things like red flag laws, limited background check reform, school security funding, mental health measures. Mental health has come up a lot in the last few days. You're a trauma surgeon, Johns Hopkins is in the Baltimore area, which has been riven by gun violence for quite some time. Of the items that are on the table, what, what would be the top of your list in terms of what you have to deal with as a trauma surgeon on the receiving end of gun violence? Yeah, so here, here's what I would say. First is, when you talk about mental health, it's very critical. Of course, we all want more mental health resources. But the critical point in this discussion around gun violence is that most, most people with a serious mental illness, they're more likely to be victims rather than perpetrators. So when you say, well, what's top on my list? I think we need to expand you know, the universal background checks to make sure that people that shouldn't have these firearms don't get them. We need the extreme risk protection orders or the red flag laws that you described. But we need so many other measures that help us deal with things like suicide and the importance of safe storage. Again, it's not about just simply this, this one solution because there is no silver bullet. Dr. Joseph Sacron of Johns Hopkins, I appreciate you starting us off tonight. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Joshua, for having me. Far too many schools have endured the aftermath of a mass shooting. 
Over the years, a number of school principals have actually formed a network to help each other move forward. Now, that network is giving support and advice to Robb Elementary School in Uvalde, Texas. NBC News Now anchor Hallie Jackson has their story. When former Columbine principal Frank DeAngelis heard about the massacre in Uvalde, he picked up the phone and left a voicemail for the principal of Robb Elementary. I guess I was pretty naive back in April of 99. I made the comment within 24 hours. I said, I hope my beloved 13 uh, do not die in vain, you know, and that this does not happen again. And unfortunately, it continues to happen. It's part of his work with the Principal Recovery Network, a group he helped found of school leaders who experienced gun violence. They offer help right away and support to principals who lead schools that have encountered shootings. Why do you think the Principal Recovery Network helps and is useful in a moment like this? Well, I think a lot of times one of the things that was kind of a trigger for many of us is principals or teachers stating that I know what you're feeling and you're trying to say, do you really? You know, were you stuck in a classroom? Did you encounter a gunman? More than 311,000 students have been exposed to gun violence during school hours since Columbine happened, according to the Washington Post. And now the Uvalde shooting has spurred the network to write an open letter to elected officials saying, we beg you, do something, do anything. But without policy changes, more schools are being forced to figure out themselves how to, for example, reopen after a shooting. Really, we have to kind of let them take the lead in talking about it. So it is appropriate to, to ask questions. How are you feeling? Are you, you know, are you feeling okay? Are you feeling safe? That's maybe the biggest challenge to recovery. How do you get students to feel safe in school again after they've experienced something as horrific as a mass shooting? Is that even possible? Well, it is difficult. And one of the things that I learned is afterwards, you want the kids to feel safe. You want the parents to make sure that they feel safe having the kids there. But at the same time, you want to make sure that you do not have things in your building that are triggering the emotion and anxiety. For the students at Columbine, that meant, for example, changing the sound of the fire alarm and choosing to stop serving Chinese food in the cafeteria because that's what they had for lunch the day the shooting happened. But it's different for each school, and there's no blueprint for recovery. There are a lot of decisions that had to be made in that moment, what to do with the space, how to move forward with the school culture. Elizabeth Brown became the principal of Forest High School in Ocala, Florida in 2018, just 45 days after a student who'd been expelled hurt a classmate with a sawed-off shotgun before it jammed. She and Greg Johnson are also members of the network. He's the principal of West Liberty Salem High School in Ohio, where he convinced a gunman to drop his weapon after after shooting a student at school back in 2017. If you look at fully recovered, meaning you're going back to the way it was before, uh, no, I don't, I don't think that's possible. But you do get your feet back under you maybe as a, as a school and as a community and you, you reestablish that new normal. These principles brought together by the trauma of leading through horrific circumstances also had practical matters to deal with. What to do on the first anniversary of a shooting or how to approach graduation. We hate to add new members to the group. We just don't want this to happen to any other principal. In a sign of the times, with gun violence threatening schools across the country, the network is set to release a guide for other principals. It'll be out later this summer, ahead of the next school year. Unfortunately, we've seen over the past few decades, it could happen in any communities, large communities, small communities, rural communities, and we just need to be there to support. That was NBC's Hallie Jackson reporting, and be sure to catch Hallie Jackson now every weekday at 5 p.m. Eastern here on NBC News Now. Still to come, suing a social network. The company behind Instagram faces a new lawsuit. The plaintiffs say that the app damaged their daughter's mental health. We'll meet them just ahead. We're glad you're with us for Now Tonight from NBC News. Parents have to watch who their kids talk to. But that's harder than ever now that the whole world can talk to them through their phones. That endless access could be fueling addictions to social media among Generation Z. That's 10 to 25 years old these days. Check out this survey from our colleagues at Morning Joe. 42% of Gen Zers said they could not stop using social media if they tried. The most common words they associate with platforms like Facebook and Instagram, depressed, angry, and alone. 
That reflects what we learned last year from internal documents made public by a Wall Street Journal investigation. Instagram reportedly knew the app was fueling body image and other mental health issues, especially among teenage girls. If that's true, what are parents to do about it? Well, one family is taking on Instagram's parent company, Meta, in court. The Spence family claims that this app fueled addictive behaviors in their preteen daughter, including an eating disorder, self-harm, and thoughts of suicide. A spokesperson for Instagram declined to comment on the lawsuit, but in the past, its leaders have publicly downplayed any negative effects on teenagers. The research that we've seen is that using social apps to, to connect with other people can have positive mental health benefits. Sometimes young people can come to Instagram dealing with difficult things in their lives. I believe that Instagram can help in those critical moments. That's one of the things that our research has shown. Joining us now are Alexis Spence, her mother Kathleen Spence, and their attorney, Matthew Bergman. Welcome to all of you. It's good to have you with us. And Kathleen, I wonder if I could just start with you just speaking as a mom and talk about the, the kind of change that you saw in your daughter, Alexis, that made you decide to pursue this lawsuit. What was it like at its worst? Thank you for having us on tonight, Joshua. This was such a trying time for us. When Alexis was young, she was outspoken, energetic. She was an advocate for not only herself, but for her peers. And she was on social media at 11 years old without our knowledge, without our consent. And from there, she very slowly withdrew. And piece by piece, we began to lose our daughter. And we really did not understand what was happening. And we did everything. We put on the parental blocks. We would go through her phone. She was not allowed to have the phone in her room at night. But no matter what we did, she had access to it through school devices, through friends' devices. And it became an addiction and it turned from something innocent into something quite harmful because she was being pushed content about body image and self-harm and being directed to speak to adults who would then guide her to further feed the addiction and just encourage this bad habit. And we are trying to protect our daughters, but the multi-billion dollar company was working against us. Alexis, there are some diary entries that are now a part of this litigation. One, when you were 11 years old, uh, you signed up for your first Instagram account and were very happy that you had reached 127 followers. You said that if I was happy and excited for 10 followers, then this is just amazing, four exclamation points. But a year and a half later, there's this self-portrait where you show an image of like a cell phone and a laptop and yourself and a, a word cloud with lots of words like stupid, ugly, worthless. Alexis, what changed during that time? What, what was going on in that period that led to that second picture? Um, so kind of like my mom said, it did start very innocently. I actually started, um, I don't know if you know what they are, but Webkins, it's a stuffed animal. <laughs> um, it started out as that. And I remember one day seeing a hashtag, it was hashtag Anna. And I was like, Oh, what's that? And, um, Curiosity got the best of me and I looked into it and it was an abbreviation for anorexia. And then that content started flooding my explore page and promoting anorexia and eating disorders. And then that led into other self-harm and suicidal uh, thoughts. With regard to it leading to other self-harm, do you think that it was the impact of Instagram plus other things that were going on in your life that combined to result in self-harm? Or did it all spring specifically just from Instagram? I think a large majority of it was from uh, social media use. It was very much glorified and um, just kind of promoted it. Uh, but I wouldn't say that it was entirely Instagram's fault, but a large majority, uh, a large blame is to meta or not doing enough to protect young girls and not only young girls but just children in general. Mr. Bergman, what's the legal basis for this lawsuit? The company is facing a number of lawsuits, but how how are you approaching this in terms of trying to hold Meta legally responsible for what happened to the Spence family? 
we're approaching this case as uh, one of product liability, uh, that the Instagram product is not reasonably safe, uh, that uh, there are many things that uh, are about the way it's designed uh, that are necessarily dangerous, but are specifically designed to put profits over people. Uh, you can make an Instagram product where a girl like uh, Alexis, who gets on and is interested in healthy food, learns about healthy food and isn't directed by algorithms uh, toward job sites that uh, promote unhealthy eating and unhealthy body image. Uh, so it's simply a question of looking at it as a product. Uh, and, you know, Instagram is like uh, you wouldn't put your kid in a in a car that didn't have seat belts or airbags or, or good brakes. Well, you shouldn't allow your kid and Instagram shouldn't be allowed to make uh, a product that is uh, the, the, the equivalent of, is, is a dangerous car. It's a dangerous product and it could be a lot safer if they put profits uh, below uh, the safety of their product. Ms. Spence, I, I, Ms. Spence I'm, I'm sure that there are some parents who are listening to this who would put the onus more on you than on the company, that it's the responsibility of a parent to know what her child is doing. And you said that you took a number of measures, but at the end of the day, I think some parents would agree with you. Some parents would disagree and say, you're her mother and ultimately this rests on you. How do you see the balance, the proper balance between what Instagram is responsible for and what you're responsible for? I think that social media platforms have made us think that it is fully our responsibility. I am an extremely involved parent. I go to all the parent-teacher conferences, the board meetings. I contact her teachers. I was going through her phone. I, I could not be more involved in her life. I think that a negative stigma has been put to this, that it is the parent's fault and it is the parent responsibility. But at the end of the day, I'm one parent fighting a multi-billion dollar company. My interest is to keep my daughter safe. However, Instagram's responsibility was to block her when she signed on 11 without my consent. I, she didn't even have access to it. She was going through on other devices. She accessed it. She was logging on. She was logging out. She was hiding it. And all of these things were taught to her through Instagram. Instagram followers who she was fed through the algorithm taught her how to hide this from your parents. You want to hide this from your parents? Do this. You want to hide your eating disorder? Do this. I could not have been more involved. And I think the real problem here is us as parents, we need to start banding together because there is power in numbers and we need to hold the social media companies accountable because we have our children's best interests at heart, but they're looking at our children as a way to push their product for their own financial gain and it's wrong and they need to do better. I know I did the best I can, but they need to do better. I do want to note again, for the record, we did reach out to Instagram and offer them a chance to be part of this conversation, and they declined, but that invitation stands. Alexis, I know we got to go in a second, but I, I think there are a number of people who look at these kind of stories, and they're just perplexed. Like, how is it that this smart... Clearly, you're not dumb, right? You've got a brain in your head. And I think the idea that a bunch of randos on Instagram can drive you to, to hate yourself just blows some people's mind. They cannot understand how that happens to, to you as a kid. I, I guess I have two questions before I have to let y'all go very briefly. First of all, do you have any remorse for logging onto Instagram when you knew you shouldn't have as a kid? How do you reflect on that decision, number one? And then number two, for people who are confused as to why Instagram is so powerful, how would you explain it to them before we go? Yeah. Um, at the time, you know, I was a child, I was only 11 years old and, um, I, what was I to, to do? I was curious and it was just being flooded to me and I had really no choice but to look at it. And I know people are probably thinking, well, you did have a choice. You could have just logged off, but that's kind of where the addiction runs in. We showed the statistic just before that I believe it was 42% of teens mm -hmm. uh, yes. said that they were addicted to uh, their devices, specifically social media. And without it, they felt depressed, alone and angry. And that would be how I felt when I didn't have it in my head. I was part of a community and I didn't realize that that quote unquote community was actually 
uh, making me really sick. And if you look at the studies, the social media platform adheres to very similar parts of your brain as any other addiction, drugs, alcohol. So we mm -hmm. really as a country need to wake up and we're putting our faith and confidence in the social media companies that they're going to do right by our kids. But behind closed doors, they're marketing ways to keep them addicted so that they can line their pockets. And no matter what you do, because I know I did, I know my husband did, we were involved, we took all the precautions, yeah. but it did not help. No matter what we did, they were 10 steps ahead of us on how to keep her addicted. Well, we will keep an eye on this lawsuit and we appreciate y'all making time to talk to us tonight. Alexis and Kathleen Spence and their attorney, yep. Matthew Bergman, thank you very much, we appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Up next, another risk factor of America's mass shootings, domestic terror. Homeland Security is warning of a heightened threat environment that might inspire more attacks. We'll explain just ahead. Stay close. Does it feel sometimes like the cultural and political pressure in America is building maybe to something awful, maybe even violent? Not to panic you, but that's kind of what the nation is facing with the threat of domestic terrorism. Now, what will happen, if anything, no one knows. But today, the Senate Judiciary Committee held a hearing to explore the threat. Members heard from Garnell Whitfield Jr. His mother, Ruth, was one of 10 people killed last month at a grocery store in Buffalo, New York. He shared his pain over losing his mother to a white supremacist and his demand that Congress take action. Every enforcement agency charged with protecting the homeland has conducted risk and threat analysis and determined that white supremacy is the number one threat to the homeland. And yet, nothing has been done to mitigate or eradicate it. Is there nothing that we can do? Is there nothing that you personally are willing to do to stop the cancer of white supremacy and the domestic terrorism, terrorism it inspires? Also today, the Department of Homeland Security updated its terror bulletin. It warned of the potential for increased violence in the coming months due to domestic violent extremism. DHS cited both the upcoming midterm elections and the upcoming Supreme Court ruling on abortion rights as possible triggers. Now, to be clear, the government is not saying definitively that there will be violence. That the bulletin doesn't say that. It just means that there is a growing number of things to keep aware of. So let's get into all that with Jamil Jaffer. He's the founder and executive director of the National Security Institute and a former associate White House counsel to President George W. Bush. We'll get to Mr. Jaffer in just a moment, but again, to reiterate, this bulletin does not necessarily mean for sure that there will be more incidents, but it does give us a lot more to think about. And that's why, Mr. Jaffer, we wanted to have you on this evening. Good evening, welcome. Thanks for having me, Joshua. So what is your sense of where we stand now with this threat of domestic violent extremism? DHS and FBI came out with a bulletin soon after January 6th. So this isn't the first time they've been warning about this, but where do you see things now kind of compared to where we were, where we were a year ago, two years ago? Well, Joshua, obviously we've seen an uptick in these activities. We've seen mass shootings, uh, some motivated by racism, as what happened in Buffalo, some motivated by personal issues, as we saw down in Uvalde. Right, but what we're seeing increasingly now is groups from the outside, nation states, terrorist groups, trying to convince people in America to engage in these activities. We also see domestic groups doing the same, playing on these ideologies, these themes, saying, you know, these are these are not real incidents, uh, that this isn't what's actually happening, that there's some sort of a conspiracy going on, trying to stoke discord and discontent in America in order to get people to lash out. And that's the real challenge. Now, how does law enforcement go after these things? when there are questions about free speech and, and, and an open discussion. At the same time, you have very clear violent attacks taking place, innocent children being killed, people being killed for racist purposes. That's a huge problem. And we got to fix domestically here in the United States. It's a real challenge, Joshua. Yeah, part of the bulletin does speak specifically to those high-profile events that could be used, as they put it, and I'm quoting from the bulletin, 
exploited to justify acts of violence against a range of possible targets. They also mention things like public gatherings, faith-based institutions, schools, racial, religious minority. I mean, they mention a number of things that have been targets of attacks, faith-based institutions. There was the shooting at the church in California targeting a Taiwanese congregation. Schools, obviously, Uvalde, Texas, racial and religious minorities, the, school, the, the supermarket shooting in Buffalo. And public gatherings, I mean, I'm kind of concerned now because it's Pride Month. And I don't want to skip the events, but, like, it's kind of a nerve-wracking... It's a nerve-wracking time. What is law enforcement able to do to deal with things like this? You know, one of the challenges is that we see increasingly some of this chatter and this discussion and this, this uh, radicalization taking place online. And so you have law enforcement trying to look at online scenarios and trying to figure out what's going on in these chat rooms. There's a huge amount of data. You don't want to suppress people's speech. At the same time, you see uh, groups from overseas, terrorist groups. We've been hearing from the FBI for years now that terrorist groups are, are recruiting Americans online and then moving into encrypted channels where they can't be seen. We see that happening with domestic groups also. So we have to figure out how do we balance free speech on one hand, open debate, and then these violent acts and how we prevent those violent acts. And we do that under a construct where, where courts are able to be involved. They're able to give law enforcement access to this information and encryption of the like doesn't simply seal off where we can't get to those terrorist groups or those domestic groups that are trying to pl plant or, or plot violent uh, attacks on children, on synagogues, on mosques, on churches, on racial and ethnic groups. It feels like part of the solution lies with Congress, with investigators, but also with the public. I mean, there's, there's more guidance now from DHS, from organizations like CISA about what they call the power of hello, the ability of frontline workers at, at you know, workplaces or who volunteer at community centers, venues where lots of people gather, to just kind of engage people, hey, how's it going? Do you need help with something? Are you law? Can I point you in the right direction? And gauge people's reactions so they have specific, actionable information to report to law enforcement. It feels like part of the solution to this, other than not letting, a self get, like letting ourselves get dragged down by all the most divisive stuff in the world, is being willing to be part of the front line and to keep our eyes open in that see something, say something way, in person, online, it, it kind of feels like we're going to have to be part of the solution. No, it's exactly right. Just like we became part of the solution in the immediate aftermath of 9-11, everyone's on alert. Everyone's looking out. Who's doing what? What am I watching? Now, look, there's also a challenge with that. What you don't want to have happen is that turn into code for going after a particular racial group, a particular ethnic group, right, or particular people at a certain point of view, right? People are allowed to have even extreme views. It's when you act on those in ways that are problematic, that, that attack people, that cause harm, that cause violence, that's when it becomes a problem. And we've got to be able to combat that in this country while also preserving our traditional rights and liberties and find that right balance, Joshua. You know, we, we thought about this a lot after 9-11. We tried to find a balance there. Sometimes we did well, sometimes we had a challenge there. We're gonna have that same problem here today and you're exactly right. It takes every American recognizing this is a very real problem. It's happening in cities around us. It's happening in churches, synagogues, mosques around us. We need to take action. We need to be part of the solution, not part of the problem. If we're standing by, Joshua, not saying anything and not doing anything, then we're part of the problem. Yeah, and for those of you who are interested in that Power of Hello campaign, it's, it's from the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, CISA, C-I-S-A. If you just search C-I-S-A, Power of Hello, it should pop right up for you. Jamil Jaffer, good to see you again. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. It is a busy primary day across the U.S. Seven states voted today. We'll focus on California and Iowa, choosing new leaders and perhaps removing two of them early when we come back. If it's Tuesday, it's primary day. This year, anyway. Seven states held elections today. Iowa, Mississippi, Montana, New Jersey, New Mexico, South Dakota, and California. We'll focus on California and Iowa. First, Iowa Republican Senator Chuck Grassley faces one Republican challenger. The winner will face one of several Democrats who are vying for his seat. Among them, former Democratic Congresswoman Abby Finkenauer, retired U.S. Navy Vice Admiral Mike Franken, and physician Dr. Glenn Hurst. They might face an uphill battle in the general election. The 88-year-old Senator Grassley has been in office since 1980. Joining us now to discuss that is Stephen Gruber-Miller. He covers the Iowa State House and politics for the Des Moines Register. Mr. Gruber-Miller, welcome. Good to have you with us. Thank you. 
So what are some of the big issues that are driving Iowans to the polls this year? Yeah, well, as you mentioned in your introduction here, the big issue is really the Senate race this year. Uh, Democrats are going to be trying to figure out their best path to taking on Chuck Grassley. And the candidates really have three different messages. Abby Finkenauer, a former U.S. representative, is emphasizing uh, the generational difference between her, she's 33, and Grassley, who's 88. Mike Franken, the retired Navy admiral, is saying that uh, it's his military experience, his rural roots are going to make it very difficult for Republicans to paint him as an extremist. And Glenn Hurst is running as an unapologetic uh, Medicare for All, Green New Deal candidate. So three very different lanes for Democrats to pick from in taking on Senator Grassley. Is there any sense of what Democrats in Iowa have responded the most to? Granted, we'll find out when the results come in, but what kind of responses have those different approaches been getting? Yeah, that's right. Well, I mean, we're about 20 minutes from the poll close, so hopefully we'll find out pretty soon. Um, Finkenauer entered the race as the perceived front runner. She uh, got a lot of endorsements out of the gate. She uh, was raising the most money, but Franken has been catching up to her in fundraising, and he's been outspending her on TV. And so, um, you know, we'll see if that's really a last minute surge that's able to put him over the top. It'll be interesting to find out. What about Senator Grassley's strategy? Has he been mostly trying to sort of just do no harm, or is he taking a new approach to certain issues, certain voters? What's his uh, campaign been like this year? Sure. Like you mentioned, he's uh, been in office as a senator since 1980. In all of that time, since his first election, he's never faced a primary challenger until this year uh, from state senator Jim Carlin. Carlin is trying to run in the Trump lane, essentially, uh, saying that Grassley's not conservative enough, hasn't done enough on certain issues. But Trump has endorsed Grassley. And so Grassley's message to Republican primary voters is, Trump has endorsed me. I've been there for you. And a lot of emphasis goes on to his role as Judiciary Committee chair in the Senate, uh, getting Neil Gorsuch and Brett Kavanaugh confirmed at the Supreme Court, and then voting for Amy Coney Barrett for the court as well. How has that been playing this year? I mean, we've been talking a lot about Trump-endorsed candidates in various primaries and elections across the country. How is the former president's presence playing in Iowa these days, both politically with candidates and in terms of what Iowa Republicans want in the future? Iowa Republicans have been very supportive of President Trump, and they've really welcomed his endorsement. Uh, just this past weekend, he endorsed uh, Governor Kim Reynolds and several uh, Iowa uh, U.S. representatives who don't even face primary challenges, and still they've been going out and telling their voters, hey, President Trump has endorsed me. So they see it as an asset. Um, certainly Grassley sees it as an asset as he's trying to fend off this challenge from his right. Um, I think the sense among Republicans in Iowa is that Grassley will come out uh, ahead, but the question is how much ahead, and again, we'll find that out later tonight. Stephen Gruber-Miller of the Des Moines Register. So I appreciate you making time for us tonight. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Let's turn now to California with some major races underway. Los Angeles is focused on the race for mayor. On the Democratic side, two candidates have led many of the polls. Democratic Congresswoman Karen Bass and billionaire developer Rick Caruso. Mr. Caruso is a former Republican. He only joined the Democratic Party recently. He has spent more than $40 million dollars on his campaign, nearly 10 times more than Congresswoman Bass has. Meanwhile, up in San Francisco, District Attorney Chesa Boudin is facing a recall election. Voters will decide whether to remove him from office early, largely over concerns about rising crime. Governor Gavin Newsom is up for re-election. He defeated a recall this past year. And California Senator Alex Badilla is on the ballot twice. First, to fill Vice President Kamala Harris's seat for the rest of her term, and second, for a full six-year term. Let us now go to the big board and the man to whom it rightly belongs, NBC National political correspondent Steve Kornacki. I guarantee you people feel like now that you're on the show, we're real. We actually <laughs> exist. You're classing up the place. Tell us what you're looking at in California. Well, I don't get a compliment like that too often, but I appreciate <laughs> that. So, well, let's start with the governor's race because it was less than a year ago we were talking about is Gavin Newsom in danger in that recall. Gavin Newsom easily, by a two-to-one margin, survived the recall. So here's what's happening tonight. He's back on the ballot running for a re-election to a full four-year term in California. Democrats, Republicans, every party is on one ballot in the primary, the top two 
make it to the general election regardless of party. Really the only suspense here in this gubernatorial race in California now is, is it going to be a Republican, one of the Republican candidates in this race who gets second place, a distant second place, or will it actually be a Democrat, a member of Newsom's own party? And you have two Democrats who advanced in November, but Newsom, a year ago we were saying, could he possibly be endangered in a run, in, excuse me, in a recall? Now he looks a very strong candidate to win a full four-year term, a second full four-year term as governor of California, where there is more suspense, as you just mentioned, right here, geographically small, population-wise big, San Francisco. That is where the Chesa Boudin recall is going to play out tonight. And you know, the way this works in California, so many people vote by mail. The polls close 8 p.m. locally. That's 11 p.m. Eastern time. And probably in that 11 p.m. to midnight Eastern hour, we are going to get a ton of votes reported out here and elsewhere in California. We may know Chesa Boudin's fate in that first hour, especially if this proves to be a lopsided election. And then you mentioned it as well, that race for mayor of Los Angeles, second largest city in the country, Karen Bass, Rick Russo, they've been leading by far in the polls. If no one gets to 50% here in this primary tonight, then the top two square off again in November. So likely Bass, Caruso tonight could be a preview of November. But you know, it's interesting, Caruso, you mentioned just joined the Democratic Party a few months ago, really trying to stress issues of crime, of quality of life, of homelessness. It was about 30 years ago, 29 years ago this week, that a Republican businessman, a 63-year-old Republican businessman, stressed those same issues, won the mayoralty in Los Angeles, Richard Reardon. So Caruso trying to repeat history about three decades later. We'll see what happens when the numbers come in tonight. Yeah, you mentioned crime in terms of the various issues that people are thinking about. We heard from a viewer, Wanda Susie, who tweeted, voted last week, dropped off my ballot, voting for Democratic candidates to get gun reform, number one issue with me. I've heard a lot of people characterize these races in L.A. and San Francisco as the possibility of California pulling to the right. Having lived there, I think at best it's a pull to the center, not the right, as if the world is just left right. But also it feels like there's a real question as to whether the progressive governments, as they are established now, can really govern when rubber meets road. It's, it's interesting to look at because, I mean, yeah, you look at the Los Angeles mayor's race in Caruso. Yes, he says he's a, a Democrat. He's registered as a Democrat now. But that is the number one line of attack that Bass and others use against him. They say, well, he used to be a Republican. He essentially still is a Republican. That's the argument they make. And if he's able to overcome an argument like that in a city as heavily Democratic as Los Angeles, I, I think that could say, I, I don't know if that would signal a shift to the right necessarily, but a shift away from the left in some ways. And then again, if we just looked at that uh, recall election in San Francisco, here we go. This is one of the most liberal cities not just in California, but in the United States. And Boudin is arguing this is a Republican-funded, this is a Republican push. If this passes tonight, if Chesa Boudin is recalled, it's going to be a lot of Democratic voters who are responsible for it. You can't recall somebody in San Francisco unless there are a number of Democrats on board with it. What is your sense of how much the National Democratic Party is looking at what happens in California for its future? I mean, Chesa Boudin, he had never been a prosecutor before he got elected district attorney in this kind of effort to kind of rethink prosecution, more of a progressive prosecutor. But I think the push for defund the police got kicked back from the president himself. You've got some politicians like, say, Eric Adams, who became mayor of New York, with a less progressive but still Democratic platform. I always worry, as a former West Coast person, that we just extrapolate too much about California. But California is also a Democratic power center. Like, it's got to mean something what happens to I think a lot of people are watching this one, this DA recall here, because Chesa Boudin is one of a group of prosecutors, as you're saying, district attorneys around the country who've run on similar platforms, a number of cities they've been elected. In San Francisco now, you know, there have been these high-profile smash and grabs. There was this uh, uh, vehicular homicide on New Year's Eve where the person had actually uh, been in custody, the, the, the perpetrator. That's become an issue of this campaign as well, just the idea that Boudin is too lenient when it comes to crime. And again, if a city like San Francisco decides to throw somebody with that kind of a platform out of office, I, I think other progressives, other Democrats around the country certainly are going to take notice of that. Again, given also some of the statistics we're seeing in cities around the country when it comes to crime. And especially because L.A.'s District Attorney George Gascon, there's also an effort to possibly try to recall him, and this might be an indicator to them 
of whether there is that kind of energy for that. That's right. You have no idea the celebrity you have brought to our program just by gracing <laughs> the big board. I can drive the Kornacki, but only Kornacki <laughs> is supposed to be there. NBC Steve Kornacki, good to see you, man. Uh, great to see you. Thank Appreciate you very much. It. Appreciate it. Take care. We will get to some of today's other top stories before we go, including fierce fighting as troops in eastern Ukraine regain some territory from the Russians and a new push to make charging your smartphone a lot easier. Tonight's headlines begin with the latest fighting in Ukraine. Today, Russia continued its siege on the city of Severodonetsk. It's one of the largest cities in the Donbas region. Hours ago, its mayor said Ukrainian forces are holding the city, but the situation there remains difficult. NBC's Ali Aruzi has the latest from Ukraine. Hey, Ali. Hi, Joshua. Well, the fighting continues to rage on Ukraine's eastern front as the Russians try and capture the Donbass region, Luhansk and Donetsk. Now, over the beginning of, uh, of their invasion there, they made some pretty good ground. Uh, from what we understand now, they're in control of about 70 or 80 percent of that entire region. Uh, now, on Friday, the Russians said that they had made a lot more gains, and then the Ukrainians said over the weekend that they'd managed to push them back. But the momentum momentum now seems to be favoring the Russians again, hitting that area with heavy artillery morning, noon and night. Uh, now, today, the Russians said that they were in control of about 97 percent of that area. But what they're not saying is that they haven't been able to take the capital, Severodonetsk. Uh, the Ukrainians are still fighting very hard. That's a very key city. And beyond the capital, there's Lysyshansk, which is just across the river. It's a town on a hill. It's very hard for the Russians. Russians to crack. And without those two cities, they don't control the entire area. Now, the Ukrainians are saying that they are outnumbered, outgunned. They say that the Russians have 10 times as much artillery as they do, but they are holding on for dear life because if they lose that area, it will be a major victory for the Russians and they don't want that to happen. And still, the Ukrainians are waiting for those rocket systems uh, to sort of hit back the Russians, but that's not going to be a silver bullet for the Ukrainians. That'll just help them defend themselves. And Joshua, elsewhere in the country, the situation in Mariupol remains horrifying. This, the shelling may have stopped, but the human tragedy continues there. Um, about 160 bodies were returned from the Russians to the Ukrainians of dead soldiers who had been fighting the Russians, mostly uh, around that steel plant. They're now back here in Kyiv to have DNA testing. But on the Russian side, they're holding about two and a half thousand Ukrainian fighters, most of them uh, from the Azov battalion. Uh, and it's not sure where they're being held. I had an opportunity to speak to the mother of one of those fighters who is now in Russian territory. He's been fighting the Russians in the Donbass area since 2015. He lost a hand in those fights, an eye in those fights, but still went back to Mariupol to fight the Russians. Uh, and now he's in captivity there. Let's take a listen to what his mother had to say. We have no um, official information. We're just uh, in a strange situation when we we can't be sure in what we must to do because uh, some of us we are willing to cry on the world and to, to 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 ask for any kind of help because I think we really need it. Most of all, uh, I'm interested to know that uh, they are in good mental um, health because uh, uh, it's normal situation for Russian prisons if people are tortured, you know. So this not knowing must yes. be so difficult for you? Yes, of course. Of course difficult. But I don't think more difficult than they are in prisons. And Joshua, his, her fear is uh, that her son is going to be hauled up in front of some kangaroo court in the Donetsk People's Republic, uh, where he could be facing a death sentence. She hasn't spoken to him uh, since he was taken, and she fears that the next time she sees him will be on Russian TV, where they may be handing out a death sentence to her son to make a point about those Azov fighters. And also, the situation in Mariupol for the civilians that are still living there is 
just appalling. Uh, there appears to be a cholera outbreak in that city. The Russians are saying that they may quarantine a part of that city. And the reason there's a cholera outbreak there is because the sanitary conditions are so bad. I spoke to a woman who'd escaped Mariupol recently. She said the city is strewn with dead bodies. They're bloated uh, and the smell is just overwhelming there. So the situation in Mariupol remains horrifying for the people still there. Clearly, clearly it does. Thank you, Ali. That's NBC's Ali Arusi reporting from Ukraine. Finally, Europe is taking steps to ease one of the great annoyances of our digital age. Too many ch different chargers for different devices. Today, lawmakers in the EU agreed to require universal charging sockets for small electronic de devices. It's part of a larger push to cut down on electronic waste. Starting in the fall of 2024, all products need to work with USB-C cables. That includes everything from phones and tablets to headphones and video game consoles, laptops too, though manufacturers will have a bit more time to comply with that. Now, a lot of Apple products have lightning charging ports, and the company has said that changing the cord rules would limit innovation and even hurt consumers, but it will have to comply with the EU's new regulation. Apple did not respond to NBC's request for a comment. Thank you so much for making time for us tonight. A quick heads up about something coming up this week. We would love to hear from you about a new book called His Name is George Floyd. We will speak to its authors this week, Robert Samuels and Toulouse Olorunipa. They're former colleagues of mine from the Miami Herald days, and they've written this amazing new biography that tells George Floyd's life story in some new ways. If you are reading the book, we'd love to put your questions on it to the authors. So get in touch. We are at NBC Now tonight on Twitter, TikTok, Facebook, and Instagram. Feel free to leave us a brief but brilliant voicemail, 888-575-2NBC, or email us now tonight at NBCNews.com. We'll plan to answer some of your questions this Friday, but until we meet again, I'm Joshua Johnson. We'll see you tomorrow. Good night. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.